I'm frequently asked about treatment choices for sleep apnea. Every person who has suspected sleep apnea needs a detailed evaluation by a provider who is well versed in diagnosing and treating sleep apnea. That means having the appropriate test, the appropriate evaluation of their physique, their nose and throat, their weight, their BMI, and so on. So identifying the correct treatment option depends on the particular patient and their needs and what they can tolerate or, or not. So once a good evaluation has been completed, then questions may arise about where to go next. If there is a nose and throat problem that is surgically correctable, and correctable in a sense that it, that is a permanent solution. I'll give you an example. Some people have some growths inside their nose, commonly termed polyps. If there is a physical obstruction in the nose and throat that can be surgically corrected, they need to go see their nose and throat doctor and get that corrected. When I say nose and throat, I also mean tonsils, which in most adults shrink in size and cannot be seen, but some adults still have them. So if someone diagnoses a, an individual with sleep apnea and never looks in their throat, then there is a problem with it because if they have enlarged tonsils and they're not removed, then you're trying to force air with other kinds of treatment into the nose and throat without removing a physical obstruction to that, so that flow of air. So that is that an important part of the evaluation and an important part of the treatment options that are there. Once the nose and throat are felt to be clear and possibly it happens quite often that people have trouble with their nose and throat but it's not really fixable in a practical way. The other uh, issue to look at is body weight, habitus, which means how you sit, stand, or lay down, what, what kind of a body physique you have, including the girth or the size of a person's neck. So again, a very common uh, recommendation from physicians who often treat sleep apnea is to consider uh, weight loss. Now, the weight loss issues um, are very often discussed between doctors and their patients, but like everybody else, everybody knows this is an issue that is ongoing, that takes a long time to address, and uh, there needs to be oftentimes a definitive immediate answer to the problem of sleep apnea. So even if weight loss is needed and may help, you may still need some form of treatment in the short term until that weight loss is, com uh, is completed and then you can be reassessed for sleep apnea. People who have uh, nasal allergies, swelling inside their nose, sometimes they need medical treatment. So it could mean nasal sprays, nasal steroids, uh, decongestants, treatment of sinus problems, and so on. So that also is part of that. Now, I want you to make a note of this discussion I just completed before getting to the next point of CPAP therapy. Very often, people make a connection between I have sleep apnea, I need a CPAP machine, or I have sleep apnea, I don't want to use a CPAP machine, tell me something else. So there is a sequence in, in, uh, in how this whole problem of sleep apnea needs to be approached. Proper initial evaluation and consideration to all kinds of possible treatments. So now we come to the issue of CPAP machines. Now, uh, most of you probably know that the word 
um, when we call it, when, when we say CPAP, it stands for CPAP, continuous, continuous positive airway pressure, meaning that we're going to blow air into the nose and throat with a machine to keep the nose and throat open while the person is sleeping. So these CPAP machines, sometimes people also uh, talk about BiPAP or bi-level machines. Uh, so pretty much the concept is the same. There's different kinds of these machines. The point is to use a machine with a mask to blow air into the nose and throat and keep the air passages open. That still is, at the present time, the gold standard treatment. Most people who have obstructive sleep apnea benefit from these machines if they receive adequate help from their provider in choosing the right kind of mask for the machine, um, how comfortable they are with being able to put on a mask, ignore the presence of the mask on their face and just sleep. The sooner somebody can adapt to it, the better they do. There are some people who are very, very sensitive to having anything on their face or they just completely refuse for a variety of reasons to use a CPAP machine. And there are certain situations when a CPAP machine is just not the right option. So where do you go after that? The next option is a mandibular advancement device, also called, in short, MAD, also called oral appliance. Uh, and these devices uh, bring the chin forward uh, while the person is sleeping. They're placed in the mouth. They look like uh, kind of like dentures or they, they uh, come in kind of different designs, different materials. Uh, there are a whole variety of manufacturers. Uh, some come ready-made, some are customized. Uh, the ready-made over-the-counter options don't work very well, as you might guess. Uh, most dental medicine, uh, dental sleep medicine providers or dentists who are specializing in sleep medicine. They customize these devices uh, to the patient. They adjust them for comfort. And then the patient needs to be retested for the presence of sleep apnea with the device in their mouth to see if it is adequately treating the sleep apnea. So that is one option. What about after that? There is a common, very frequent question about implantable devices. There is a device on the market that's been FDA approved for several years. It requires implanting um, a, a, an electrode into the muscle of the tongue to stimulate the muscle uh, while the person is sleeping. It's controlled by a computerized device. Uh, and it, the purpose is to stimulate the tongue muscle with a very small amount of electrical current while the person is sleeping to cause the tongue muscle to shrink in size, become smaller as it's stimulated by the electrical current, and thus uh, increasing the amount of space in the back of a person's throat. So many people don't realize that the tongue muscle is a huge muscle, much bigger than what you see when somebody sticks their tongue out. So that is a practical treatment. Uh, it is not universally available. It is very expensive and much more expensive than either a CPAP machine or an oral appliance. Uh, there is a strong push by certain people to, to use these more often uh, and so there's many pros and cons, but that is also a form of treatment that, that is out there. And then there are completely non-invasive, very benign looking treatments that are also approved by the FDA for treatment of sleep apnea. One of these consists of these uh, uh, stickers that you put on your nostrils that seem to close off your nostrils but in fact, they don't. They have tiny holes in them, uh, allowing air to pass naturally and normally through the nose while you're breathing in. 
but creating a little resistance to the back flow of air as you breathe out through the nostrils and thus creating um, a back pressure inside the nose and throat which opens up the air passages a little. These uh, are available by prescription and uh, the problem with these is it's, it is very hard to determine how effective this treatment is in a particular patient. Uh, I often um, encourage my patients to utilize this form of therapy in situations when they have to go camping or they're going backpacking, they cannot carry a machine with them, um, or it's just convenient for them to have this very light disposable uh, form of treatment for a few days uh, that, that, that may at least control some of their symptoms. But we, what we don't know um, in every situation is how effectively it is treating them. Uh, there are other uh, over-the-counter treatments that are often used by sleep medicine specialists um, that you can Google them or find them on Amazon, uh, little clips that will help open up your nostrils a little bit. They can help somewhat with snoring. Um, they, there's a lot of variation in how they're designed and their cost and whether they work or not, and it is difficult to assess how effective they are. Uh, people sometimes use these when somebody's sleep apnea is very, very mild, uh, or they mostly have sleep apnea when they're lying on their back but not on their side, uh, certain situations. So this whole long discussion, what this all means is you have to be able to consider a variety of options uh, for the treatment of sleep apnea, but first go through a uh, thoughtful evaluation of what is wrong, how bad it is, what are the consequences of not addressing it, how important is it to treat it the right way, and then what exactly is the right way. Also, in this long discussion, I did not mention any kind of uh, surgical options that involve uh, surgery of the palate or the jaw for two reasons. One, um, surgery of the palate, either with uh, lasers or with implanting uh, certain kinds of beads in the palate or cutting off part of the palate. Um, they uh, were used many years ago. Um, we find them to be uh, inconvenient, painful. They have uh, long-term uh, side effects in terms of discomfort and pain, and they do not seem to be very effective. So there are, when, when there are non-invasive and uh, more convenient and easier options available for treatment, these surgical options have gone completely into the background. And uh, then there is the issue of uh, surgery of, uh, of the jaw to help the jaw move forward. Uh, and that is major surgery that is not universally available. It requires uh, a very specialized um, surgical approach. Uh, obviously, think of uh, cutting off part of the bone or, or part of the joint of the jaw to move it forward so that it creates more space in the back of the throat. Uh, it is a much more invasive, expensive option. It may be worthwhile for some people, uh, particularly those who have major physical bony structure abnormalities. So, uh, some people have uh, facial features uh, that require such, such surgery and they have to go to special, specialized centers where this kind of surgery is performed. Much more uh, curative, much more definitive would be a much more complicated form of surgery that would open up the bones in your nose, throat, face, and jaw, increase the space inside your nose and throat so that air flows smoothly in and out while you're sleeping, 
and while you're awake. And of course, that is extremely invasive, um, not really recommended, not performed in, the, in a general sense. There may be some very, very specialized um, centers where some form of this kind of surgery may be available, uh, but is not one of the usual treatments uh, available at the present time. Future uh, options uh, are developing constantly uh, newer machines, smaller machines, smaller and better masks, uh, better oral appliances. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research that is being done to treat sleep apnea. Anyone who has sleep apnea today needs to have it treated today to prevent ongoing damage to their body and uh, to prevent uh, significant consequences over a period of time. So we cannot just sit and wait for the right treatment to, to become available. We have to make use of what we have now to the best of our ability. And that requires working closely, as I began saying in the first place, with a provider who is well-versed in diagnosing, evaluating, and treating sleep apnea-related conditions.